Baltimore, Maryland, RadioOnFire.com, home of the Diamond K Morning Show. New episodes stream daily at 9 a.m. The call-in number is always 404-436-1277. Today's broadcast is brought to you in part by the Baltimore Music Awards. Let your voice be heard at the 2017 BMAs. Polls are now open for the 7th annual red carpet event honoring Baltimore. Log on to BaltimoreMusicAwards.com before December 3rd to cast your vote in all categories. So December 3rd is right around the corner. If you still want to cast your vote, you got a few days. Log on and cast your vote. Radio on Fire broadcasts reach over 276,000 viewers per month. Advertise your product, service, or event on Radio on Fire by sponsoring an episode, particularly of Speakeasy, for as low as $50. Visit RadioOnFire.com slash promo to get started. If you want to see any past episode of Speakeasy or any other show, visit RadioOnFire.com to watch us on demand. Click radio shows in the name of your show to see any episodes you missed. Diamond K, what's happening? What's going on? You know you got to turn your mic on when I'm here, man. You know you got to turn your mic on. It's, 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 uh, it's been a lot going on. You know, uh, Speakeasy wasn't here uh, last week, what's up, Joe? I see you. Speak here. Speak easy. Wasn't here last week due to the Thanksgiving holiday, but uh, it's been a lot going on, man. How was your uh, holiday break? Yeah, holiday was good. Yeah, holiday was good. Getting it in with family. Yep. Yeah. Getting it in with family. Got a chance to, uh, you know, spend some time with family. So that's always good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did. A, I did a little something. Did a little, little bit. You know, um, went went to went to some some good people's houses and they they took care of me and i was out there enjoying the holiday man but it's been a lot going on man and it just you know it's, it's time to get back to it um you know i'm ej store one half of the speak easy the sophisticated savage uh lady pope jennifer pope is running late today she uh called me last night real excited she's about, been running late since last night no 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 <laughs> not running late since last night <laughs> She called me last night, calling me to tell me she has something going on. She sounded real excited. So I don't know what she's got going on. I'm, I'm definitely going to probe when she gets here. Um, she's supposed to be coming in at 8, so we'll take a break uh, around 8. I don't know what it what it was, but it's, it you know seemed like it was something important, man. But but definitely jumping right into it, man. I want I want to go with some quick hits, man. I saw the movie uh, Justice League, and uh, I want to start out with something light. I saw the movie Justice League. I'm a big comic fan. I love Marvel. I love DC. Love DC. I love Marvel, man. And uh, I saw Thor Ragnarok. I, I'm a big fan of Thor. And the movie was very comical. Um, not very source material related at all. But it, I, I read somebody say it was the worst movie they've ever seen. A, a lot of people don't like it. I mean, Thor was, was really a big comic bit. I didn't see the Justice League, though. Yeah, yeah. Thor, oh, Thor was funny. It was good. I mean, it wasn't really comic related to Thor. Um, didn't do Thor justice, but he hasn't been getting done justice for a while. But Justice League was really good. You saw it. Did you like it? I did. Did you like it? I mean, the, the reviews from Rotten Tomatoes is terrible. Yeah, but I, I don't pay them no attention. <clears throat> yeah. I They're think, whack. I think, th- I think there's a conspiracy against DC. I truly do. I think it's bigger than that. I think it's... I just think they don't like like mainstream movies that uh you know that we wait for like those Mm -hmm. type of movies the big budget you know it's not just any superhero movie i've I've seen them come down on like any of those big they give they give marvel a lot of good ratings consistently like what movie they i mean thor was highly rated yeah but thor was horrible so i'm saying you can't trust them yeah you you can't and and at least they they allow you to post the fan rating but i think justice league was was beautifully done um, a lot of people criticized DC movies. They said they were too dark. They weren't funny enough. It was a lot of good comedy. It was a lot of good action. It was good. A lot of comedy. I mean, it was. I didn't think co- it was a lot. Compared I thought there to, was some compared but, to past films. But do we need comedy though? No, it's not a comedy. No. I saw we didn't come like to see a people comedy. complain and like, but the total movie and some other kind of stuff. It, does it give you that feeling when you watch it? Yes. Then it's good. Yes. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to follow the, the, the formula. Mm-hmm. You, get, you must have one part comedy, one part action, right. one part drama, right. two different storylines going. And, you, know, you don't have to do all that. If it feels right. good, which it did. It felt great. It I, really did. I love Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was awesome. Aquaman was awesome. I didn't know how I was going to like him. 
as Aquaman. Oh, that, I, I, knew, I knew I was going to love was, him I mean, Aquaman. I like him. You know, I like he's him from, from Game of Thrones. And, and uh, it's dope. another movie I forgot on Netflix that he's on. But he kills all um, of the roles he has, man. And he truly but see, is see, So you remember the cartoon? Yes. Okay, so I'm picturing that Aquaman. You're, pic- you're, you're picturing Justice League and Friends. Yes. Blonde hair, Aquaman. That, that I watched Arthur every, Curry. every week. Yes. But... You know what I mean, but no, he he was he was he's Aquaman. He's now. Aquaman. Yeah, he he's Aquaman, thing. and that that joint was the thing. truth. And I just I loved how, you know, Bat Ben Affleck is killing Batman. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I love Ben Affleck as Batman. I okay. mean, when we look at this Batman, he's he's aged as opposed to. to is he your favorite? He is beginning to grow to be my favorite. Christian Bale, I never really liked him as Batman. He's really he's really one dimensional. He was really corny, you know. Just physically, you know, they altered a lot. Now that now what Chris, what Nolan did with the movies is undeniable. He is the man. Un, it's undeniable. But the best movie wasn't even you know portrayed. The best movie was The Dark Knight, and it, Heath okay. Ledger Agreed. stole the stole Agreed. the show. Agree. You know, so so it was the best movie because of Heath Ledger. Yes, Barna. I mean, Barna. I Barna. can give you that, Barna. but you didn't like you didn't like the uh, the uh, what was the one with Bane? Batman be not Batman Begins. Uh, the dark the Dark Knight Rises. Night you Rises. You didn't like that? It was no. I like I like the entire. The trilogy. villains make it. That's why I didn't like the first movie in the in the in the uh, trilogy. Batman Begins because it was like I think what was it who was it Scarecrow? It was, you had Scarecrow and then you had Ra's al Ghul and the. Uh, and the League of Shadows. And it was so slow. But it, it was it. But a lot slow. of a lot of these introductory um, yeah. movies are supposed to be set up films. I just don't like Christian Bale as Batman. But Ben Affleck is the epitome. Hold up. What was the guy before him? Um, the guy before him, you had Clooney, Val Kilmer. Okay. Did you like either of them? No, I mean, they, I like Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton is always going to go down. That 1989 which, version which is going to be classic. surprised me that I even liked him in that oh, yeah. role. Oh, yeah. Because they did classic. comedy for so long. It was a classic. Now, he worked. It's classic. Uh, Jack Nicholson as a Joker worked. Yes. Jack Nicholson is a classic. That's Tim Heath Burton's Lever, version. Yeah. And it was a classic. It was, it was definitely a classic. It's a definitely. classic. But Ben Affleck is the epitome of Bruce Wayne. He is rich. You know, he has the attitude, you know, and I just like the overall swagger he brought to the movie. And the good thing about him being in it is that physically where you had Christian Bale, who's a much smaller guy, you got now this Batman and his whole crew. You know, when you think of superheroes, you're thinking of somebody of a massive stature. Is how was Ben Bat- Affleck? Ben Affleck is 6'4". Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's 6'4". Well, how tall is Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman's 5'10". Okay. So, and that was a big beef that I had with people saying, oh, she's too skinny. But it was like, name me another actor or actress that was as big as her physically. And then usually she put on them boots. She's over six feet. She's about six six feet. feet. She's at least six feet. So she really, and she really looks like Wonder Woman. People were like, oh, she's she's too skinny. Whatever, she was an but, imposing figure. But, I, I you, she did but you're not gonna get you're not gonna get her to be super brolic. She has to be, you know, a, a, a certain cut to be Wonder Woman. But she embodied Wonder Woman, and and, and it's, it's just dope. And then Cyborg did a good job. Ray Fisher did a good job. I liked him. He was dope. I liked him. I liked him. I liked the whole movie. So I definitely wanted to talk about you that. You want to see another one because it's clearly they set up another one. Oh yeah, it's. I mean, it's a whole. I mean, Aquaman is coming out 2018. So that's going to be dope. Um, I'm waiting for them to release more information about the Batman solo movie. You know, if you saw the ending of it, you see the you see the ground being laid. You have a Deathstroke in there, and the dude that I forget. I never remember how to pronounce his name, but he's also another six four guy. You know, what I'm saying the one that got on the boat. Yes, yes. Okay, so they said that's another Justice League movie, or that's another that spin-off? that. So there's one, there's two ways they can go with that. There's three ways they can go with that. They're gonna probably have him and working with um, Lex Luthor to do the Legion of Doom thing. They, he could have his own solo film, and then he could also be the nemesis in a Batman solo film. So it's it three seems, different ways. It seems to go like with they're that. going towards a Legion of Doom. They're gonna do. They're gonna do that. Which they're is setting, hard. That's that's hard. It's gonna be dope. That's it's hard. gonna be dope. They setting the platform up for that. But a, a Deathstroke movie by itself would be something more lines of, along the lines of think of Hitman movie, right? Like because he's an assassin, so he's gonna do some crazy stuff. And um, they all they also said I think. 
the director. Have you ever seen a movie of The Raid? No. The Raid. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's a it's an Asian flick, and the director of The Raid is basically just a martial arts. Just if you like martial arts, just close quarter fighting, crazy movies. That joint is crazy. He's been picked to direct um, one of those movies, and his fight scenes is gonna be crazy. So if you have a Deathstroke movie, think of hero, think of assassin for hire, that's gonna kill people just recklessly and just do all kinds of crazy stuff. So kind of like the mechanic or one of those Jason Statham type films, you know. Um, so it's it's definitely lined up to be something dope, you know. So I was very pleased by that, um, despite the critics. It it's slowly picking up on the money. It didn't it was the lowest um DC opening film, but I think a lot of that was because of the critics. I think the critics and there's a lot of hate for the DC movie universe. There's a lot of hate. Um and people just don't call it they don't call it objectively. Like people were talking about Marvel saying, Oh, it had to be comedy and then, you know, when it was comedy they it wasn't enough and then they were arguing, well, it's not close to the source material, but DC has been the most accurate with source source material. So, you know, and uh, brother brother Upshur saying they did a good job with the Flash and Batman. The action scene was pretty good. They cut some possible good scenes out, and they did cut a lot of different scenes out because um, Zack Snyder let Joss Whedon and them get in there. But overall, man, the movie was dope, and the critics are definitely lying. So, shout out to the DC universe, and and go see it if you didn't. I also saw another movie I wanted to talk about real quick. Disney, uh, Coco. It's a children's movie. Um, it's about a young man in Mexico um, basically trying to connect to his ancestors and chase his dreams. When I tell you this is one of the best Disney films I've seen in a long time, it was crazy. It was just dope. I, I, had, I, I didn't like, like Disney has a subtle way of playing on cultural themes. And so at one point I was like, damn, this kid is in here and they talking about how his grandfather was a deadbeat dad and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, to the culture, to sometimes it is true, but it just always seems like Disney always paints our ethnic uh, characters to be something different. But all in all, man, that joint was super dope. If you haven't seen Coco, go see it. It was a fun family movie. I really liked it a lot. Um, Another quick hit: the Supreme Court, the Su- Supreme Court, I believe the Supreme Court of Maryland, or it could have just been the National Supreme Court. I'm not sure about that. Didn't fact check it too much, but they decided to uphold the assault rifle ban that Maryland had and, and enacted in 2013. Um, so they they were basically rejecting a hearing petition to break the ban. Um, so that's a quick hit on that. Tiger Woods played golf with Donald Trump. And a lot of black people were a little upset about this. I don't understand the outrage. We know that Tiger is different. He's Cablasian. Um, I don't know how much he feels Cablasian after being arrested, you know, a couple times and treated like a black man. But, you know, he played he played golf with Donald Trump and he opened up uh, the first round today. And he, I think he's three shots under par, and I think he's doing doing good starting off. I mean, as a sports fan and Tiger breaking the barrier to golf, I want to see Tiger do good. I really do want to see Tiger do good. I want to see him get back to glory and, and win another one because, you know, despite what he identifies himself with, a lot of the naysayers just see a black man invading on one of their sports, and a lot of the naysayers have hated on Tiger for a very long time, yeah. and and I want him, I want him to do well. I want him to catch up. Um, will he ever truly, you know, be the black athlete that we want him to be? Probably not, but you know, the optics are still there. So shout out to Tiger for his uh, first round today, and seems like he's he's done good today. Um, switching gears. NFL just agreed with the players coalition to donate a hundred million dollars over the next six years. I think it was 90 to a hundred million dollars over the next six years to go to any social injustice or justice cause that the players coalition identifies as important. Diamond K and, and but under the, under the speculation, under the, the, the standard, 
that they will end their national anthem protests uh, in 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 conjunction with them getting this one hundred million dollars per year for the next six years or whatever it is, as long as these players end their protests, the NFL will fund this. Dominic, what are you what are your thoughts on that? Um, is Kaepernick getting a look? Well, the thing about that is, and I was going to speak to that, um, the Players Coalition has never really formally invited Colin Kaepernick to the table. That is one issue that some of the players in the coalition have had. Um, Reed and and Thomas, uh, who are both defensive players in the coalition, have decided to leave the coalition because they feel that Malcolm Jenkins, who has represented the coalition, has not uh, asked for their input in certain issues. And every time that they have met, that that Malcolm Jenkins has met with the NFL and representation of the coalition, he's done it without all of them being there. Um, So they kind of felt like this decision was not a total call to arms and they, they felt like they weren't included. And I think the funny thing about this NFL Players Coalition, Malcolm Jenkins is the head of the coalition, but to date he has never actually taken a knee during the protest. He has always he's raised a fist, he's uh, done different things, but he's never actually taken a knee. So it, it's kind of interesting that he has been one of the sole uh, leaders, uh, if you want to call it, for this coalition and they haven't really said anything further other than that, that they were leaving because of those reasons. But for them to take this $100 million deal in, in hopes to say that we're not going to protest during the national anthem. If you donate this money to our social uh, causes, I think, I think it's, it's kind of selling the movement short, but that goes back to the NFL boycott. You know, what was the boycott really about? Was it about the fact that the NFL is uh, penalizing Colin Kaepernick, blackballing him for standing out on his on his issues? Or is it the fact that we're finally getting light to discrimination that has existed in this league for years? Or is it that the players coalition is pissed off that they work for owners that really don't care about them as human beings and as their culture. So I, that's why I've always asked, like, what was this all about? And for them to take a hundred million dollars to say they're not going to protest anymore. How credible is this player's coalition? Yeah. Especially considering the fact that they haven't done anything, them saying they're going to do something, you know, let me see y'all do something. And then we can talk about it after that. You know what right. I mean? I mean, they're virtually throwing money at the pot. They're virtually saying, and, and, and then everybody, anybody that knows anything about receiving money, receiving grants, receiving any kind of financial package from a long, from a organization like the NFL, you know, the NFL, I'm pretty sure they're not going to just let them have this carte blanche and just say, you know, whatever you want to do, do it. But the other thing is if you have players that are in the actual coalition that have issues with how it's being ran, how much can we really trust that everything that they do is going to be on the up and up? Not saying that Malcolm Jenkins has any reason to do anything wrong, but if if Reed and Thomas don't trust the direction of this coalition, what was the real mission here? And, you know, ratings-wise, I haven't heard anything negative about the NFL taking a hit for ratings. Uh, Playoff season is around the corner. Uh, where where is the NFL what boycott? What do you mean when you say you haven't heard them? Well, rating, ratings haven't ratings haven't been suffering in 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 weeks. Ratings have been back to normal. Ratings are not where they were. No, this no, no, time no, last rate, year, ratings haven't been where they they've have been in a long time. They've increased from they they they've pretty much stabilized for this season, mm-hmm. but it's still down from last season. But but that's not a new trend. That that's the whole point. What sure. people had to realize that the NFL was that's already true. losing ratings. Uh, hence why they started the London nine o'clock games. Cause now see, we're talking about domestic ratings, but we're not, we're not thinking about the picture that the, the NFL is, is painting to get an international market. They had a game in London. They had a game in Mexico city. You know, the NFL is not suffering. The NFL went from a $400 million, uh, company. As Papa to a, John's that. 
well, Papa John's, well, well, Papa John's, you know, he put himself out there and he lost. He lost his, he lost a little battle. But, but here's the thing. I said this from the rip and, and shout out to Miko Grimes, you know, who I, who I tried to get with. I tried to listen to her podcast. I couldn't stick with it, but I think she is very insightful. She said the same thing I've been saying for the last six months. You got to go after the sponsors. You know, you got to go after the owners. You got to go after the sponsors. And Papa John's is a prime example sure. as to why we had to do that. And I've been saying that for the longest time. You have to realize, man, if, if we just looked at Baltimore and we looked at the ownership here, you have to have a targeted, concentrated boycott of something. And we we didn't boycott anything that was going on in every city. If people were to be like, I'm not coming to the stadium, I'm not buying anything that you associate with, there would be there would be a lot more progress. And it's crazy because Papa John's came out, the owner came out, said what he said. Immediately he suffered. Even though a lot of people said, I don't like the pizza because it sucks anyway. If that wasn't the icing on a cake, you know, you pretty much put it in the oven. You pretty much you pretty much tossed it in the garbage when people became aware of the fact that you were one, a Donald Trump supporter, two, you're very much with these owners, three, everything you're saying is virtually negative, and he's taking a hit for it. You know, so it, it's evident that, you know, we have to focus our efforts to the ownership if we're going to boycott. But, you know, it was one thing I also said that kind of pissed me off with this boycott was that, you know, you had a lot of people, quote, unquote, saying they're going to boycott but they never actually watched the NFL. And that was another problem. It's like you can't truly boycott something you never supported before because your dollars didn't count for anything in the first place. It's like the concept that we know of boycott comes from the Montgomery bus boycott, right? How many people participated in the bus boycott that had cars? You know, a lot of those people didn't have other means to get around, so they truly sacrificed something that they loved. So when I said the thing of we have to boycott the sponsors, the companies, the organizations, you can't boycott every single thing. But there are some things that you could target that we could target collectively that we could have did without that would have made an impact. But but here's 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 and I've heard you say this point before. Yes. Here's here's my insight on it. You can boycott something that you didn't do before because you screaming about it raises awareness for it. So let's just like they had the boycott of the restaurant in Atlanta that T.I. said was being racist. You remember, you remember that? Yeah. A couple, maybe about a month ago. Yeah. And they, they boycotted that. And I think um, it was a couple, I can't remember. Maybe Jeezy was involved or. Mm -hmm. or um, and so I've never eaten in a restaurant, the particular restaurant you saw before, but I know where it is. Now, even though I've never eaten there before, if I go to the boycott and I tell all my friends, Don't boycott this restaurant, even though I've never spent the dollar in there before, the fact that I'm promote, actively promoting the boycott is helping the boycott. And it's, and it's it, my voice about it, my pictures, my signs can actually reach somebody who actually does go there. Mm -hmm. And then the negative energy hurts the business anyway. So in part, I agree with you, but it's, it's two different entities because the NFL works differently. A restaurant, you have to actually go in and patronize. Yeah, that's if, their only if, source of revenue. Yeah, and if I tell you not to go, the, the restaurant is losing because the potential that they could have been making is now diminished. But let's, NFL, say that, let's say they have sponsorships. Let's say that the restaurant has has some other sources of income, which a lot of them do. Right. Let's say that they they doing business with Coca Cola and right. all these different type of people. So me directly not going in there mm -hmm. hurts revenue, which hurts the you know ability, the cable bill the and, and, and uh, the direct TV whatever. But, but that's that's that what I'm connected. saying. That the difference is the fact that you actually have to get in there with but the NFL. Think, they make think money. That, you don't think some girl posting a um, boycott the NFL on her social media. Right. Let's just say some fly girl. A lot of people pay attention to. She posts it. She don't watch football like that. Right. But she posts it that she's right. not supporting it. Mm -hmm. You don't think that just that alone doesn't mm -hmm. does not hurt NFL? No, it, I'm not, I'm not going to say it doesn't hurt them in any way. I, I never said that. And any bad publicity is bad publicity. Yeah. But I'm saying at the at the dollar. 
It, this is it, dropping the bucket. It's, yeah. it, it, it ain't. It might not even. Right it might not even be nothing because you mean they if, don't feel if, it. Probably. If, if none of your followers TV ever mess with me, if none of your followers ever mess, if, you, if none of your followers ever bang, never bang with the NFL, they didn't lose nothing. They didn't gain nothing, which hurts. But they didn't lose nothing. But you don't. Do you think that this negative, this black eye that NFL has had for this season, this dragged out thing? Mm-hmm. Just doesn't hurt. And no, it it, def, it definitely hurt in some ways, but I think I still see jerseys. Yeah, you know and, what I mean. But and, we and, don't know what's old jersey. We don't know whether that's a new jersey. And, but or, even, even still, you have to think about the long game. The owners are the NFL, and I've been sure, saying this: sure. the NFL is a shield. Look at Roger Goodell as him. a shield. Yeah, the owners are. Everything NFL. If you want to hurt the NFL, now what I think what which was one of the dopest things that we should have that every city in the nation should have piggybacked off of when people in this city decided to go down to M and T and boycott. That was something that Outside directly that directly impacts the ownership of the Ravens. How it it's it's a black eye. Not only at this Negative point, business. it's a black eye for that franchise specifically. People now saying, oh, I don't want to go down there. I don't want to use this ticket. I don't know what's going to go down. You know what I mean? Sure, so sure. so you got to take that approach. And if you notice, one of the most vocal and outspoken owners is the richest one from his team, Jones. Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones, who he had to get. But here's the thing. He had, he had to get in front of this, though. Because Jerry Jones has played chess with this. He's got in front of it on one point. Then he said other things on another he point. Went too far, then he though. went too far left. Yeah. But Jerry Jones is Jerry Jones is still the owner of the Cowboys where their fans are just so loyal. Yeah. It, don't, it, don't, it, it don't really matter. But he was smart enough to know I can't be just one way He's pulled all back, the time. Though. Yeah. He, he, yeah, because he, he felt that pressure. You yeah. And then you also got to think that Dallas is in Texas. You know, how many of these fans, I mean, he got national fans. How many of these people really care? You know, you, but, but going at the ownership was such a, a major thing. And, and I think, you know, we really dropped the ball and not really going at the owners and the sponsors and the, and the companies that follow behind them. The other thing about the boycott that continually pissed me off, like I said before, was that, you know, it was it was so many people. If you ever looked at it, it was so many people that were NBA stands that arbitrarily believed it was cool to boycott the NFL, mm-hmm. but they can't look at their own league and see how connected it is. Right now, I wanted to talk about something, and I'm gonna I'm go into my other quick hit: Freddie versus Jason, Fab and Jadakiss mixtape, Friday on Elm Street, Fire. Um, the the biggest the biggest track on that. Talk Future. about it. Talk about it's definitely the biggest track with Tiana Taylor. What a, that okay? What about the Swiss Beats track? Oh, every everything on that joint. I mean, you can let it ride. You can let it ride. Swiss Beats is a distant cousin of mine, but everything know. on there is fire. What's it? What's it? What's it? What's the one uh, with the Marvin Gaye? Uh, uh, I, don't remember the ta- I don't remember the track name. I even it like the French pimpish. Montana joint. I like, I like the whole, the whole thing. joint. Like the whole is thing. fire. Yeah, I, I but it, it was one thing that I think. Fab or, 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 or Jada said how uh no it's Fab who said this is that was Mark Jackson's team and Kerr got the credit. And it's crazy because you want to be mad at the NFL for, for blackballing people for doing the same thing the NBA did 20 years ago. But Mark Jackson, one of the best guards ever in the game. One of the best sports personalities to ever call a game. One of the best coaches in his short time and short record still does not have a job till this day. Now, I had to kind of pull back a little bit because, you know, my barber let me know that, you know, Mark was in there trying to tell players not to curse, trying to bring a lot of Bible scripture in there. I didn't know if was those things. I didn't fact check that. I don't know how it is. I know that Golden State ownership did not like his anti uh, LGBTQ stance. You know, yeah, definitely I, not in Cali. <laughs> definitely not in the Bay. You you can't do that in the Bay. You know what I mean? So I definitely think that was a large part of it. But I didn't know that he was telling players that they can't curse and 
they can't do this. I didn't know that he was doing that. Um, and to me, for somebody like Mark Jackson, who played for the New York Knicks in the 90s, played with Anthony May. I think he, he played with Mason. He played with Oakley, I think. Um, and, and, you know, he grew up in, in Queens, you know, and I mean, he went to Catholic school. But, you know, you know what time it is. So I, I find that far fetched that he was trying to get these guys to, to, to be that way. But it's a damn shame that he can't get a job. Are you kidding me? And it, it goes Give back some time. It, I mean, it's been a lot of time and it goes back to the Patrick Ewing syndrome. Patrick Ewing couldn't get a job. But um, what's his name that used to coach Tom Thompson said he made a great point on uh Brian Gumble show. He was like, well, how many six ten coaches in a league have you seen? <laughs> so he, he said it's not a lot because there is a stereotype that if you're a certain height, you're dumb, you're slow. The point guard is usually thought of as the smartest guy. So he felt like Pat Hewing really was a victim of that. But on top of that, you know, the NBA coaches, if you're black, you're held to a different standard. The coach in Memphis just got canned, just got fired. Um, and when you look around the league, it's really not a lot of heralded black NBA coaches. Same thing with the NFL quarterback. I've said that on this show before. Tyrod Taylor got benched for some bum, and now <sighs> Buffalo's going back to Tyrod. As they should. As they should. They I should never, never should have never lied. I never was a major fan of Tyrod Taylor, wow. even when he was in Baltimore. I, not because of the height. I just didn't. I, I just always thought he was like of all of the black quarterbacks and the criticism they get. I always felt like he was he was deserving of it because he was kind of erratic, but he's talented as a mug. You know, you can't deny that he's talented, but he, he also never has really had a, a fair a fair shot. But, um, you know, the, the, this league and these sports franchises and these, and these sports leagues, they're inherently racist. And if you thought that Colin Kaepernick was the first time, you're out of your mind, you know. So it's like the NBA to me and the NFL are are the same game. Um, sticking with the NFL, Eli Manning got benched. I'm not a Giants fan. I don't hate the Giants. I'm a Jets fan. I'm, I'm glad he got benched because I think that's the beginning of the end. It's time. He's done with the Giants. I don't know if he's done – Playing in the league, I never. I, I think he get another job. I, I, I mean, some people think he might come across the locker room and play for the Jets. I always thought Eli was super overrated. I thought he was super overrated. He only got in the NFL because he was a Manning, um, but his stats. Don't I mean, he's lie. talented. Stats don't lie. He's talented. He has a ring, right? If I got remember two, correctly, he yeah. has two rings. He um, has two rings. I mean, you can't deny that. Yeah, you know, you you can't. One time can be a fluke. I think I you think can. the defense I think the defensive line got those two rings, but but Eli stats wise numbers don't lie, but they also don't tell the whole truth. True but right. Eli Eli man, you know he had this Iron Man uh, streak of starting football games, and you know if anything, you could always say you know the cat's gonna show up to play. You know no matter how banged up he is, no matter how hurt he is. You know, he's going to show up to play. So you got to respect that in this league from that position, man. But I think the Giants are heading to a dark place that their fans are not used to. Um, Giants fans are about as spoiled as Ravens fans. Hmm. But y'all Ravens fans I think they might be more worse. spoiled because they're in New York. I think y'all are worse. How? So, eh? Y'all franchise is only 21 years old. Okay. And y'all got two championships in 21 years, and y'all still be crying. Y'all still be crying. That's because we that's because we never settle. We always want more. So when we win, we don't say, yeah, we won. We let somebody else win. We want to win all the time. And yeah. I think that's a great attitude to have. It is, but you don't vilify the quarterback that got you a win. Flacco has been we nothing but that. good to you. Well, and I don't know about that. I mean, in comparison Flacco to Flacco checked out after he cashed the check. Nah, nah. go across the league, right? Go across the league. Look at all of the quarterbacks that have ever been and ever was. You had somebody like a Matt Castle who, when Brady went down one season, played three or four games and then got a $60 million check and never won anything, never won a game, never won anything as a starter. Look at somebody like a, um, they wrote Alex Smith off at one time too. 
Um, Alex Smith doesn't have a ring. Alex, is my point though. Neither does uh, what's the name you were just talking about? Castle. Yeah. But these guys, but these guys got these big time contracts. Sure. They didn't play a damn thing. They didn't get into the playoffs. They didn't do anything. Yeah, but they didn't have a contract that Flacco had. But they, they no. In in scheme of things, they virtually did. For Castle to get like sixty four mil, be in Seattle, and Russell Wilson, a third round pick. To come out and beat you out for the job, yeah. that was a waste of bread. At least Flacco had uh, and that all a wasn't chip on his ring. All that wasn't guaranteed. I think it was. I think uh, you can fact check it. I think if it, it was. is, they, that was a big mistake. But but it happens all the time. Sure. That's my point. But that's bad. That's bad management, and, and that's 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 that has nothing to do with if if a player can cash out on the on the man. Yeah. By all means, cash out. Right. Because that's just bad. On their part, like look at Miami, how how they wasted that. Jay money. Cutler, you know I what mean, I'm saying? I but, think but that's come the back, status but, quo. That's yeah, the status right. quo. But but the right. whole my whole point is, at least with Joe Flacco, he took you out through the playoffs and he played clutch in the playoffs. He played absolutely outstanding in the playoffs. He, did. he was ice cold and and he did his thing. I'll give you. I that. would I would give him 110 million for the Jets if he's gonna get me a Super Bowl. We paid more for less. Yeah, but see the thing is, is that when you like when you said look around the league, he's not that guy. He was part of a team effort. Mm. He didn't will the team to the victory. You know what I mean? And if he <sighs> if he willed the team to the victory, I would say he deserved that money. I think he did in the playoffs when it came to playoff time. Because I remember that. I run. mean, he was accurate. I remember that run. The defense was giving up points. They were playing from behind. And Joe literally had to get them down there and went in and Tucker won the games. So, you know, it, it comes. It was a team effort. You it was, it. but, it was but the quarterback, effort. but the quarter, but, but that's the same argument with Eli. That front four that they had was phenomenal. Nobody could block him. You know, Eli played well. He did his thing, but it's like, you know, it, it's so inconsistent when it comes to the quarterback position. People, one thing, one day they want to say, you know, if you win, it's like a pitch. If you win, it's all on you. You know, if you if you lose, it's all on you. You know, you can't do the wrong, can't do right, can't do wrong. But I, I think, you know, I don't know where you guys are going in the future. But ironically, you know, start off the season looking terrible. You guys are in the hunt for the playoffs. So as a Ravens organization, y'all looking pretty good right now. Looking pretty good right now. But um, switching gears. I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about this uh, homicide of this this murder of the uh, slain Baltimore City homicide detective. I I really when it initially happened, you know, we talked about it on the show, and I kind of stayed away from it um, to a degree because I just didn't know what was going on. I thought it was tragic. From everything that it seemed like when it first started, I was just like, damn, you know, who was out here on the streets, you know, killing cops, homicide detectives at that. And it wasn't even I didn't even know that this brother was shot at 4 p.m. Um, was shot at 4 p.m. during the day. Pursuing a, a lead. I didn't even know that that happened. And when I found out that that happened, I was just shocked. Sassanate shot in the head, no suspect, no nothing going on. Then we learned that this brother was testifying against some of his fellow officers. Eyebrows were raised. Oh, yeah. Then we find out that the ambulance transporting a Baltimore City detective of 13 years. I might be wrong. 13 years, I believe, had an accident. What up, Monty? Had an accident. Then, uh, what else came out recently? I forgot uh, the rest of it. The the ambulance crash. Then there was something else behind that. Testifying, ambulance crash. The amount of time that the ambulance took to get to him, I just found, like, this was crazy. And, you know, my ear is not really to the streets like it, it could be, but Dominic, what's really going on with 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 this with this murder? What's what what's really going on? Well, uh, initially, 
I, I think that the red flags were there, but I felt like people were jumping the gun mm -hmm. on it. However, uh, it really, the facts look like this is something internal. Mm. And um, I think that the Baltimore, the, the Baltimore police want to handle this internally right. because they don't want the feds involved. Because if the feds get involved, I think the whole structure comes down right. because this looks crazy. Right. And the feds are corrupt too. Right. But, you know, an officer killing another officer as that's supposed to testify and some corrupt officers, that looks crazy. Like yeah. they got to nip that in the bud. Yeah. Uh, and if Baltimore does what Baltimore does. Right. The feds is going to get involved anyway. Well, the feds are the fed. The, the department is already the the department since Freddie Gray has already the Department of Justice has already been involved with the department. Yes. since Freddie Gray. But after a, after uh, Trump came mm -hmm. and uh, Sessions mm -hmm. is attorney general, mm -hmm. they was kind of like hands off, kind of like it's all good. You know right. what I mean? It was like all these probes and stuff going on when right. President Obama was in office. Then when Trump rolls over, put session in charge, you know what I mean? What are they, you, what slow I, down. you know what I mean? Trump's talking about, yeah, hey, hey, throw him in the back seat, do that. You know, he's saying all that kind of stuff. The mm -hmm. climate was different. But with some some blatant stuff like this, they're gonna have to jump on it. And um This is crazy. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, you have a Baltimore. I mean, how tragic is this, man? You have a you have a Baltimore City detective whose primary assignment is to investigate homicides, right? Killed and shot in the head at 4 p.m. during the day. His partner was one place in at the scene, and he was at another. And then we come to find out he's shot. Like, like I'm trying to fathom how is it that somebody who's supposed to testify in a case against their fellow officers is out there in the street working the day before. Do you do you think that the other officers look at him as a snitch, or do police officers not use that type of thought process? Well, I think any type of organization, any type of insulated brotherhood, any type of fraternity, you're gonna have that opinion. There's, to say that 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 opinion does not exist is asinine. Because do you think he do you think he felt like he was in danger? I don't know, man. I, mean, I guess we can't. We can't. I don't know. Uh, I mean, in, in respect to the family, is so felt, but yeah, respect to the family is so it's hard to, to to discuss. But I don't know. I mean, he's out on the beat the day before. I don't think he. What well, that means have. that, but see, and, and that, the reason why I asked that is because he he was working. So that yeah. means that he did. He not had no feel, reason to he think did not feel he would be in danger. danger. He felt right. like. I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm playing it cool. I'm playing it normal. Everything's going to be everything. Nobody knows what I'm doing the next day. I can't see it. I, I can't think see everybody it no other way. knew what he was doing the next day because we knew what he was doing. And, and it wasn't like it was some classified information. So we Was knew, it out there publicly? Uh, I, I mean, after his death, it was it was out, it was oh, yeah. out there within a 24 hours. Yeah, after his death. So that but means I, but it had I'm, to have been out there. But I'm, I'm, agreeing, with, around I'm, a, the, you know. I'm agreeing with you to the extent that I think, because think about it this way. If you, were, if you were testifying against anyone, you would be in some sort of protective custody possibly, right? But for you to be out in the street as if nothing is going on and – you're in the line of danger. That kind of that that doesn't strike me as somebody who thought they had to be in fear of their life. Yeah, I mean, I've I've had you've had beef before, right? Yeah, I've had beef before, and and so when I've had beef, hey, auntie, I you hey, know do, you're gonna do some things a little bit different. You're gonna move different because the beef is is on. not gonna take the same block. Exactly. Not gonna go to the party. Exactly. Exactly. Not gonna go to the deli or whatever, whatever it is. Even, yeah, he you gonna move I mean? a little different. And you, if you yeah. do all those things, you either so cocky yeah. that I wish somebody I would, wish, I wish or, a dude would, or in the case that I feel this was is that I'm just doing my job. There's no no big deal. Or, or you thinking like nobody knows? Like 
I've also been in those situations where people were like, nobody knows that was me that did that. So I got to act is normal. Though. No, I think this is different because, you know, he was subpoenaed. The test you, in order to be testified, you got to be subpoenaed. Yeah, but they but so they, they move know. quietly. They the judges they're, they're supposed to move. The same. They're supposed to move quietly in those situations. Yeah, especially True. the ramifications of what he's doing. That's not something you're just gonna find on Maryland judiciary case. It's true that. You know, so I if I'm him and I'm in a unit, I mean, like like there are Dick Wolf shows about this type of stuff. Like if you watch mm-hmm. Chicago PD right now. They well, you know a, what they do? They make it about everything that happens, and then say they know it. This is a it's a fiction. Yeah. It's a based on fiction. They, they change one or two things. They they there. pulling this straight from the source of somebody who's experienced it, Absolutely. and it's like you got those situations literally right That's now. Why we love that show. I, literally right now right. on Chicago PD, you got a, a, a mole going against my man Hank Voigt. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you know they, they telling him, you know, uh, Bubba Gump shrimp. It's telling him, act normal, yeah, do this for me. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, why would you think you need to protect yourself if you didn't know that you were in danger? But, it, it you know, it, we, we speak lightly about it, man, but it, it was tough, like, looking at his family, having to, you know, stand stand up there for his funeral. You know, I don't know that man. I never met him. But any any loss of life is, is crazy and it's terrible, especially with everything surrounding this. The other thing that I found was crazy, right? Have you ever been? I'm sure you have, but we know there's a March funeral home over west and there's one over east, right? March funeral home? Yep. The March funeral home over east on North Avenue, and I think there's uh, Asquith, they have this pole that says stop the killing. I think Baltimore, we have to really realize anytime that one of the biggest black mortuaries in the city has a sign saying stop killing on their property. Now, I don't know that, and I'm not fact-checking, I'm not a representative of March Homes, March Funeral Homes, none of that. But I would think to some degree that even if this was not promoted by them or, or that they know it's on their property, I would think that if they didn't endorse it to some degree, they would have it removed or something. But any time that you have a, a totem pole kind of thing on near that proximity of a funeral home to say, stop the killing, yeah, there is a serious problem here. You know, I, I've attended a funeral home, at, I mean, a funeral at their funeral home, and I think what's going on here, it, it's just egregious, man. And it's like when you have when you have a homicide detective murder, let's just say we didn't know anything of the backstory. We had a homicide detective murder. Last night in Cherry Hill, a cop was shot. I mean, what the hell is going on, man? Like, what is really going on out here? What's going on in our streets? And what is the city doing? What is the city council doing? What is the solution? Where do we go from here? You know, like, like, how do we fix this thing? And it, and it's very alarming. It's very disturbing. And um, I just don't know where we're going to go with this. But switching gears, um, Jennifer probably is not making it tight. So I'm going to go with this on my own. Libya. L- Libya. Slave trade in Libya. Now, of all the things that I've ever said about Donald Trump, there's one thing that I agree with him about. You know what that is, Don McKay? Only one? One thing that stands out more than anything. What's that? When Donald Trump stood up and said, you know, basically F the uh, UN. Basically, you know, I'm going to take care of my country. The same way that y'all have preserved y'all's, y'all country, y'all preserved y'all country. Y'all haven't done a damn thing in in light of the UN. I don't blame him for that. The U.S., anytime there's some kind of world crisis, and I'm not talking about Puerto Rico. I'm not talking about Haiti. You have to understand Puerto Rico is a U.S. is a U.S. territory. Haiti has a number of Haitian citizens, Haitian-born people in the U.S., and it's miles away from the U.S. They need to they need to always step in there. 
But anytime something's going on, I remember the Republican agenda was like, we got to go to Iraq. We got to liberate these people. We got to do this. We got to do that. How is it that the U.S. always jumps in? We always send our troops. We always send our soldiers in there. And the U.N. that is designed to be this world beacon of light doesn't do a damn thing. Oh, that's easy. Um, we send our troops in, and we don't always send our troops in. We send our troops in when there are natural resources involved. That's Very true. what we send our troops in. Very true. Now, the UN, just like any other uh, democratic organization, mm -hmm. has red tape and a hierarchy and a whole bunch of rules yep. to get something done. Yep. And and it takes a long time to get something done. People yep. got to agree, you need to vote, yep. majority, all this kind of stuff to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So it's long-winded. Yep. But what we're doing right now, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow, but what we're doing right now is setting up for a ground war in Korea. That's what's happening. Mm. They in they if, if you look back to nine uh, mm eleven -hmm. that 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 era, they install this fear mm -hmm. through the media, through the news, through everything. Fear, 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 fear. Fear monger. Fear monger, exactly. Yep. And then they make this move. And so, because the president can't declare war, what they do is try to get some other act to happen, and then we'll retaliate. So we're not really declaring war. We're just retaliating. We're responding. But we're, we're just responding, responding yeah. for what happened. And yeah. so if if the planes, uh, if Korea, uh, you know, Northern Korea's planes come within a certain uh, airspace of war. ours, going to war. you know, then you can say, oh, we didn't we didn't declare war. You know, there was, there was an act of aggression and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I think that like a lot of Republican presidents, we are teeter tottering in the area of war. And if, mm -hmm. if you notice, everything they're saying is that you know if you don't do this, that we want to handle it ourselves and stop with the oil. And you know, I mean, they're just throwing these little hints there, and uh, they want resources. They'll go in, which they do. Yeah, and and the thing is with Libya is that the UN, you can't tell me. And this is, again, why I agree with, with Agent Orange, Donnie Trump. You can't tell me that Libya, that the U.N. just now learned about this. The U.N. is saying, oh, we'll investigate and we'll figure out what's going on. How do you Which not know what's going time. on? That's well, crazy. I, every, well, anybody with a phone can see what's going on. Yeah. I mean, and, you, and you've known. Have I mean, you, you, got, some of those you got people. Yeah, you got, you got people on the ground there. The U.N. is everywhere. You got yeah. people on the ground there. No doubt. You mean to tell me you didn't know what was going on? They have people in every country in the world. Literally. 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 Operatives. Not to mention the not to mention the briefs that they get from US, Britain, British intelligence, Russian intelligence, you know, Chinese intelligence, everything. You gotta be kidding me that the UN literally is taking the stance to say that they have to do research on what's going on in Libya. And it's funny because we talked about this on the show once before, you know, saying that, you know, if 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 the, these type of events came to the U.S. and it came to our doorstep, that we would retaliate and that we would, you know, we would die basically fighting for what we believe in. And I've always said, man, you know, as Americans, we have been afforded a very much uh, fortunate life. Um, these people in Libya are, are poor. They have no structure, no means to organize and, and save themselves. And this is tragic, man. I mean, it's 2017, and what's been going on in Libya probably has been going on other places and in Libya for well, much longer than what we know. I mean, the, the thing about it, and I guess for people that don't know, we're talking about the recent reports um, that uh, sub-Saharan Africans are being sold some as for as low as $400 in uh, 2017, as he said. Yeah. Um, now, Libya, if you, if, you, if you don't follow world events, um, Libya is the, the area that collapsed uh, former Libyan leader, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Gaddafi, yep. Right? Regime. Yep. With the help that this this regime of went down. Obama. Went, went down. President Obama. Now, now who, what, what country? The U.S. President and Obama. NATO. President Obama. And they have yet Gaddafi to rebuild down. this country. So it is, yeah. it is, it is a war zone. It's terrible. Um, it's terrible. Obama yeah. took a die. That's that's probably one of the worst things. In in theory, I mean, because people always paint these dictators to be one thing or the other, you know, Gaddafi, because they want something. Gaddafi, Gaddafi, Gaddafi proposed the idea of telling African nations we need to band together, we need to charge these other nations, we need to get our money, and they killed him, which makes sense. He's Made basically sense. saying. Africa first. Yes. That's all he was saying. That's all he said. Africa first. I want a national African, I want a continental African bank that's going to charge all these other nations for everything that they're stealing from us. And this is why people that are really in-depth into politics don't trust politics. Because as good as Obama was, he killed, he had a hand in killing, he had a hand in killing Gaddafi. And now look where Libya is. Now look where they are. Yeah, well, I think that the thing about it is that President Obama was victim of his intelligence, mm-hmm. who he had in positions. Very and true. if you look at it, one thing that I understand the philosophy of Trump to a degree mm-hmm. is that I don't want to trust the these, people around yeah, me. Yeah, these same these yeah. the same people that he had. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I we ain't even filling these positions. Yeah. I don't even know who I'm putting in positions. I, 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 understand I agree that. with that. Because you, he, you he was like, I'm tired of people the doing the same holdovers. thing for 20, 30, 40 years. I agree with that. Yeah. I can't, I mean, I don't I don't like I don't like Donald Trump in the scheme of things. Right. But he had he made some damn sense. He said, Look, he told the UN, I'm not breaking the US back to do something with y'all and y'all haven't done a damn thing. And he said, yo, I'm not going to hire the political status quo. I'm not going to keep bringing in the same people that, that botched Benghazi, that did this, that did that. It makes a hell of a lot of sense. But you, but when you do put people in, they, these need to be people with some type of qualification. Yes. It can't be, you know, you know, they, he's been, he hired Devos. somebody in a, in a high level position that did something at his daughter's wedding. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just yeah. like random. Yeah. So that, now clearly that's just some cronyism. Yes. But I'm I'm saying putting some actual qualified people in positions. But that's always relative because you know we also we also don't know because I will also say in probably ten years or so he's probably the highly he's probably one of the most highly scrutinized presidents after Obama. Obama was extremely highly scrutinized because he was black, but. A lot of people didn't really dive into the political decision making he was doing because he's a politician's politician. He was a senator. He knows what he's doing. Donald Trump kind of, you know, people are digging into it. But I wonder how many people really just put in any old person in cabinets, in in positions that we really don't know whether they were qualified or not. And if it's just magnified because (laughs) of Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump is still an asshole. He's still terrible president but he made a lot of damn sense when he said i don't want to bang with the un i don't want to be the status quo i get it well i totally get it totally get it so i mean it's definitely it's definitely terrible what's going on in libya man and 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 we gotta do something about this um switching gears again i've talked about on this show diamond k probably for the last three or four months about rape culture in this country I've talked about how every time I turn around, I see a story about a young female teacher um, having sex with some boys. Uh, We know the common theme of old men trying to take advantage of younger girls. But the sexual harassment charges, the, the allegations, Matt, Matt, uh, Lore, Matt Lauer, Matt Lore. I never watched this motherfucker on uh on 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 the today. I never watched this guy. Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer. I never watched him. Apparently a lot of you people knew who he was though. Loosely, yeah. I mean, apparently a lot of people love watching this guy. 
Like twenty years. I mean, he's been he's been putting it down. Yeah. I didn't really. I honestly tell you the truth. I didn't really watch that network that much at that time. Yeah. But it's it's insane that this dude got jammed up, and it's crazy because you got some people that get the allegations and they vehemently deny it. That doesn't mean that it's not true. Then say that. But you that's, got, that's you the got, Republican way. Oh no, no. Do not, I mean that yeah. I mean that sometimes is the most that's the most logical way to do it. Deny, deny, deny. Yeah. But then you got some of the guys like him that come out and apologize because they know they're foul. You mean to tell me this guy at what is he on? CBS? NBC? He ain't, he ain't nowhere now. I mean, what show would never was CBS, NBC? Whatever it was, had a switch under his desk to lock the door to prevent people from getting out. What the hell is going on? Or getting in. That's how you look at it. Now me sitting right here, if I have a door, if I have a button that I could push that would lock the door, that would be convenient for me. You also you all you're also not on you're also not downtown Manhattan. Or or midtown He's at Manhattan. Rock. They have thirty rock. Yeah, you're also not in downtown Manhattan with fifty stories in between you, uh, two doormen at the door, staff security, secretary. Yeah, you saying that he don't need all that security? What did you? Had what did you need? Unless you're preventing. Unless this was and the windows you could see out, but you couldn't see in. And unless you're telling me that this was a preventive measure for. Uh, some type of terroristic type of thing. Somebody's trying to hijack the studio. What did you need that for under your desk? Well, I, I'm gonna tell you why. And um, you know, it's I don't know how this is gonna come off, mm. but he about to say something. He, I think he was on some. He was feeling himself. Mm. He's the top guy over there on that network. Yes. Uh, that morning show brought in most of the revenue for the yes. station. Yes. Uh, so he's a very he he was very good friends with the uh, the boss of the station mm -hmm. uh, of the network, and and so he felt like he was untouchable. He could do whatever he wanted. Uh, there were a lot of rumors about his um, you know being promiscuous, mm -hmm. so that was already out there. And I think he had all the little fly stuff set up in his in his office because clearly he's fucking in his office, <laughs> and he wanted to make it convenient. He thought it was fly, like they real high up. And, yeah, you know what I mean. He got the little the funny tent windows, yeah. like if you're in a police station or something. And yeah. you know what I mean. You got all that kind of stuff going savage. on. So he's it, a savage. Yeah, so he's doing he's doing this thing, and and you know some of these girls is with it. Uh, the problem that I have here's the problem that I have. Okay. okay? Okay. Now let's just say you're him, right? You're him, and so he be, he's 59 now, so he's been doing this 20 years, right? And he wasn't been, at the level. He, 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 he wasn't he, at that level. He's been years. savaging but he's for 20 been, years for for a long time, and they and they saying that he was having a relationship with some girl on that show on the show, mm -hmm. uh, amongst other other women in the building, right? Okay. Other journalists. Okay. Okay, which it will come out. Um, yes. But let's just say. And I think that most people have have been in the situation. You he's screwing somebody at work, mm -hmm. right? Let's say that works out for a couple of years. Yeah, cool. It's fun. It's wild. It's crazy. Yeah. But as happens in every job, mm -hmm. now new girls come in, right? I want, I want that. Now I ain't checking for you no more. I want that. Me and you was was wild and crazy. Maybe I was oh I was your boss, right? So, so maybe I was so, your boss. So you, oh, well, here, you maybe I was your boss, here. right? Oh. Now this twenty three year old girl comes in here. Oh. So now I'm on her. Mm. You mad? Mm. Now I mess with her, and 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 the whole cycle repeats itself. Now we like four or five new candidates down the line. Mm. The climate's changed. Now the first girl is mad. And she's been mad for a long time. And now she got a way to get back at your ass. I go to human resources with my lawyer and I say, this happened. It was consensual, but I was in fear. Any woman who got an attitude or axe to grind can do that. Yeah, that's very true. 
and ain't shit you can do. Not at all. Unless you got some text messages from a beeper or something from back in the day. But what but what about what about his what about his apologies? And, oh, like and he's married. What are you? Oh, yeah. 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 His I apologies mean, so, was whack. So do you feel like the apologies was more addressed to the fact that he's married and no. how it has people looking like no. I mean with the, the apologies to me personally and I'm not forcing myself on you. And not underage. If I was in some kinky, kinky two you know, consensual adults, you know what I'm saying? I'm not apologizing. I'm not. Like unless unless if I believe that it was consented, you know that I pulled my joint out and you know you did what you did. I'm a foul guy, but I'm not apologizing for committing a crime. Which which gets us to to Russell Simmons. So I, I think that what has to happen is you need a guy with some swag mm -hmm. that addresses this honestly and addresses the elephant in the room. Cause like one of the, one of the, uh, uh, um, congressmen, this woman said she was sexually assaulted in the picture. They took a picture and he put his hand on her butt. That was her assault. That was the assault. Yeah. That's not assault to me. That's not assault. I think as a guy, most guys have, you know, accidentally, Oh, you know, my bad. You know, that's not assault. You know what I mean? That's not sexual assault. Impolite, bad etiquette. Yeah, sexual assault. No, not hardly. And any time that a woman, uh, you know, feels a certain way, now the culture's fucked up. Now there is bad things that happen. Absolutely, absolutely. But in between women at work who sleep with bosses or people on the job we've talked about because that because they the show. feel you know for pressure. advancement for but there's also whatever. women that do it because they for trying to get theirs yeah i know some personally that but done 20, that. me too but 20 we have talked about that but 20 yes. years later this mature woman may look back on her actions differently and yes. feel like she needs to be vindicated exactly and, and and how many times have I said this? I've said this on my show. I probably say this once a month that women have a tendency to look back on relationships differently when they're not in love anymore. Mm -hmm. So that when they used to love you, they loved you. Now they right. don't love you anymore. They they act like that love never existed. Like I never loved him. So I mean, we, we we're not saying rewriting history. So we're not saying that we downplaying the fact that it could happen. Real victims, though. They, yeah, I mean, they, I mean, I, I don't want to, and I understand. I don't, I get it because it's, it's a very sore topic to say who truly is a real victim and who is not. I think the thing that always consistently bothers me in any crime in any instance is not the allegation; it's the burden of proof. I think yeah. it's, it's like how much do you vet or how much. And then people will say, you know, it, it's not easy. It's not easy to prove. Um, it's always going to look negative. But how much does the burden of proof come into play? When we're talking about a Russell Simmons. It depends Simmons, because, and, and, and I'm waiting for this to happen. Right. I'm waiting for the right guy mm -hmm. to get accused mm -hmm. and fired. Mm -hmm. And then he sues the corporation for wrongful termination. Absolutely. And then... Then, then we really expose, or we really, we really uh, uh, unpack what was your real harassment, what was your real, was your real axe to grind, and right. the moment that happens, and it will happen, and somebody gets vindicated that, and when he looked at every situation, it wasn't that. Mm. That's gonna be a game changer. Yeah, and I mean the thing, like I said, uh, uh, the thing about Russell Simmons, Russell Simmons. And in that whole situation, now Russell Simmons has a history. Which situation are you talking about? The, the elevator one? Ye, no, yeah, with, well, with the, the with the with seventeen year old girl. Oh, you talking about the one? We the, the one that was on that was trying to get on. Russell and Simmons. That's not even the one. The, re, the most recent one. Oh damn, Rush, Russell Simmons has a history of messing with girls seventeen to nineteen years old. But he also has a history of drug use. Oh yeah, definitely. But that doesn't excuse anything. True. Russell Simmons has a history of messing with 17 or 9 17 and 19 year old girls. True. He got with Kamora Lee when she was 19. True. 
and but he also married her. So I don't know what her parental involvement was on you know that issue. I don't know if they supported him marrying her, but he was like thirty something marrying her at nineteen, and they they build together. No, he might have been younger than that. Might have been old. He might have been older than that. They built together. They built baby fat. They had kids together. Yeah, they and, they, they 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 more than uh, ten years. Yeah, old. and then and then now she's this mogul. She's this person. And where she, did she get that from? And and she got it all from him. So yes. I'm wondering, is she gonna come out and say anything in his defense? She, is she gonna comment to say, "Well, this is what anything. happened." She can't say anything. She gag gotta orders. Out, she got to stay out of it. She got no, gag no, no, orders. She, gotta, she ain't got no gag orders. She just got to stay out of it because yeah. it's like. He's she's probably one of the people that's gonna be controlling the businesses because you know he's stepping down. Right. So I don't think I don't think they have any I think they got mutual partnerships and certain things. Yeah. But I think a lot of things that he has now is self directed to him. Yeah, but and he I mean, trusts her. Yeah, but Russell Russell Russell, everything that Russell steps down from right now, he can afford to step down from. It's not gonna really kill him. But it, I'm just saying he has a he had a history, you know. So him potentially messing with a seventeen year old girl in ninety eight which would make her... But listen, that, and that ain't the first girl, just because this one is he married. He he was, he like you said, he has a history of of a certain type, type. of girl. He does. He, especially during the 90s, he uh, frequented fashion shows, and, and he picked girls from the runway type, like models and aspiring models. Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's what he was into. Um, and, and yeah, so somebody like me, I, I I can't. When I heard that, I'm like, okay, that sounds like him. But you know, the other question I have, you know, and it's not to place the blame anywhere, but it, but I just wonder for this situation, like where were where were the parents and what was going on, you know, and is it a power? It, it, that 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 whole dynamic is a power and control thing. You know, even with the young boys and the teachers, you know, um, there was a, a teacher in Columbia that made students have sex with her to get an A. You know, and it's funny, I joke because I say, where were these teachers when I was in school? But there's a power and control dynamic to it. Yeah. And I don't know, like, you know, I just don't, I never understood how Russell can get to a Kimura. I don't know the backstory. Um, I don't know how he could get to this 17 year old girl where she was out with him and someone else. I mean, so that's a larger issue. Um, but it's, it's certainly one thing that we can say there's certainly a rape culture problem. But then I moved to Wendy Williams and talking about Terry Crews. And I, I saw one of the shows talk about it earlier this week. I didn't really get to hear what they had to say, but I don't know if they said this. I felt like, Wendy Williams took Terry Crews' experience. Now, I even talked about it, and I said, brother, you like six six foot plus, 200-something plus pounds. You could defend yourself. But then when you really unpack what he said happened and how his wife over many, many years said, don't do anything, don't fight this man because you're going to get arrested. You're going to look like the big black ape, and they're not going to see what's going on. That's the truth. And I said that. That's That's the truth. And so – Wendy Williams goes on her show to talk about this incident. So my thing that I've always said, Don McKay, I always said this, right? If you are an old school rapper that's mad at rap, do something to be consistent and help young rap. Yeah. If you're an NBA, if you're an NFL boycotter, but you don't boycott the NBA, be consistent and boycott them both. Don't be a, a perpetual advocate of rape, period, or rape culture, period, and then crack on Terry Crews. I didn't like how Wendy Williams opened up her show talking about Terry Crews and how he was fondled and they minimized the whole shit. And if you look at the if you look at the show, the audience is continually laughing. The because audience, of the way she portrayed it. Exactly. And the audience majority female, majority female, and they're cracking jokes and they're laughing and at the gay. fact. Yeah, and then last majority the female fact, and gay male. I mean, yeah, if if that, I'm not speculating, but but I mean, they they well, it's know, possible. Yeah, a lot, Probably. a lot of yeah, yeah. 
that cracking joke on Terry Crews. But I think that's part of that's, that's part of problem. the culture that has to change. That's too. a problem. We have to change the culture, and I'm seeing a all lot, the way around. You're with me. I'm seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of a lot of messages about how black men, like very smart brothers, had an excerpt a couple years ago, a year ago, how black men are the new white people, and how we don't <laughs> we don't verysmartbrothers.com, oh. very famous blog website, basically talking about how black men exert their privilege to down degrade and, and, and denigrate uh, uh, black women, which happens in a lot of instances. But I think black men are really, we've always been at the bottom of the total pole. We've always been the most endangered species. It's the truth. You know, when we get pulled over, when we get stopped and frisked, you know, our lives are way more in jeopardy. We're way more highly over incarcerated, unfairly, unjustly. We're at the bottom of the totem pole. I think the sad part of things that's happening now is that our own culture, our own queens and, and our own people are kind of downplaying the things that we go through. And it's sad. And to see Wendy Williams do what she did to and talk about Terry Crews is the epitome of what I'm talking about. Be consistent all the way across the board. Rape is not cool. You felt like she should have been outraged for him. She should have been the outraged she for this is, guy. She should have been a lot more sensitive. And I don't know that she is uh, or has been outraged with females. I haven't seen yeah. her in other instances. She has. But she she totally put him out there like he was a sucker. She put him out there like he was a sucker. Well, um, I don't think he was a sucker. I think that he didn't know how to handle the situation. No, I know but that. It, we know that. There is a way that he could have handled the situation aggressively Definitely. as a male Definitely. without whipping his ass. Definitely. And he could have punked him down. Definitely. Without whipping his ass. And I think that's more so what but he's talking here's about. A, here's the other thing, though. In that moment, right, even if he had done that. And we armchair quarterbacking. So Monday morning quarterbacking at this point because it's, it's, we, yeah. we, we, we weren't there. Hindsight. We weren't so, there. Yeah. So I'm like, in that moment, could I have kept my cool to aggressively no. approach? No, no, but but fine then. But you could have you could have stopped yourself from beating him up. Maybe not. Or I mean, maybe Terry Crews is a guy where if he turns it on, he can't yeah. turn it off. That's, that's, and that's his wife true. was like, "Yo, I need and you to come home." She probably knows that. She was like, "I need you to come home." But but that ain't the problem that we're talking about here because Terry Crews was able to come on live TV. And do what a lot of people can't do. Which shows that he has balls. Do what a lot of people can't do, despite his movie career possibly being on the line. He said, look, I'm going to out you. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to join the movement of things that are going on. So if you look at the scheme of things, you got these actresses coming out and saying what has happened to them. Terry Crews is coming out. If anything, you could look at this as a coalition to say, yo, this dude who is a massive massive structure of a person you know is coming out saying yo i've been violated this is my story yeah. instead of running that banner to support this guy who's been on her show wendy wendy clowned him that shit was corny yeah that was like super corny for me super corny for me i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe it and her audience was like hysterically laughing that's because they they drink the Kool Aid, you yeah. know what I mean. Those are the diehard Wendy Williams fans that mm -hmm. are that are in that crowd. Well, they also they're also the people that don't want to understand the black man. They're also the people that don't want to care about the black man. They're also the people that 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 don't want to support the black man. But but what's crazy is is that if you if you think about it, when we talk about what these men, Harvey Weinstein, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Charlie Rose, mm -hmm. uh, Russell Simmons, mm -hmm. Mark, uh, Matt Lauer, mm -hmm. uh, whoever, when we talk about them, we talk about the guys. Yeah. The people that perpetrated the act against the women. Yeah. When we talk about Terry Crews, we don't even talk about the guy who perpetrated who it? it on him. Don't. We instantly focus on the black male. Yes. And, weak. And, and why didn't you do this? Being weak, and, right? And it's just it's, it's it's twisted up. 
It's fucked up. Yes. And, and it's, it's indicative. Backwards. It's indicative to everything that we as black men are going through. Like I said, even with the relationships, ladies want to say, well, I need me a strong black man. But first moment you get, you want to emasculate this man. You know, and it's sad because a lot of these sisters that were in that audience, a lot of these sisters that are out here doing that, they they are raising black men. What are you raising them to be? You know, what are they what are they gonna be? What are they gonna be the what are they gonna epitomize? What are they gonna look up to be? I mean, for Terry Crews to go through that, you talking about the dude that played Chris Rock's father on it's all about, you know, you know, it, it's crazy, man. So I don't know, rape culture is real. We gotta be consistent and we gotta understand that it happens to everybody. And the other thing is, too, that I was going to say is, you know, had it not been for technology right now, would we know that all of these young teachers are sleeping with these young men? <laughs> Probably not. Essentially making Probably them not. over-sexualized, essentially making them predators, essentially. Yes, that's true. You know, essentially making them something that is out of the norm. If I'm a like, don't get me wrong, and, and I you know, many of us joke about it societally, but it's like, damn, it was that teacher where we wanted them, you know, um, over-sexualized boys have a different trajectory than over-sexualized girls, you know? So if you're messing with a woman that's 23 years old and you're 16, what does that do to you that then does something to somebody else? We're not talking about that. Yeah. Not talking about that. True. But real quick, I'm going to go to the script. RayOnFire.com, home of the Diamond K morning show. New episode stream daily at 9 a.m. Calling number is always 404-436-1277. Today's broadcast, bro, I'm sorry, today's broadcast and every other broadcast was brought to you in part by the Baltimore Music Awards. Let your voice be heard at the 2017 BMAs. Polls have been open, but they are open for the seventh annual Red Carpet event honoring Baltimore. Log on to BaltimoreMusicAwards.com before December 3rd to cast your votes in all categories. That's December 3rd, BaltimoreMusicAwards.com. Polls have been open and they will stay open till December 3rd. And is that 12 a.m. December 3rd or December 3rd on the dot, meaning December 2nd, 12 a.m. Polls are closed. Uh, 11.59, December 3rd. December 3rd, 11.59 a.m. So you have all of Sunday right. of December 3rd, De December 3rd, 2017, Sunday to cast your vote at the BMA's BaltimoreMusicAwards.com. Radio on Fire broadcast reached over 276,000 viewers per month. Advertise your product, service, or event on Radio on Fire by sponsoring an episode of the Speakeasy or other shows. For as low as fifty dollars, visit radioonfire.com slash promo to get started. If you want to see any past episodes of the Speakeasy or a side of shade or uh Rap the Scrap or um Roxy and Whitney, I think it is Whitley Whitney show. I like that show. Uh visit radioonfire.com to watch us on demand, click radio shows and the name of your show to see any episode you have missed. I like that show. I like the um I like the rap the scrap. I like the side of shade. I like um the Roxy and Whitney show. I like the um what's the one with the brother from Harlem or Brooklyn, the lady and Beautiful then, Lies. Beautiful Ugly Lies, Ugly Truth. I like yeah. that one. What's another one I like? What's another one I like? I like the one it's a um she looks European of some kind. Dark cape, dark black hair, sits on this end a lot. I don't know her name. And then there's a brother with glasses that sits in the far right. I think she might be Greek or something like that. Oh, okay. What yeah, show yeah. is that? Intune Radio. Intune Radio. I like that yeah. show too. It's some dope shows. Iranian. She's Iranian. Iranian. I apologize. I apologize. There's some dope shows on the network, man. I, I, I tune in. I try to show love. I try to click. I try to, you know, comment here and there, you know. Um, I, I definitely like being a part of the family, man. But um, kind of close up a little bit. Yep. I'd ask you, you saw the original uh, She's Gotta Have It yep. by Spike Lee. Yep. 
Spike Lee is is a I'm a fan of Spike Lee. Um, depending on your generation, depending on what time of New York you're from or <laughs> black culture you're from, like my mother and many of her peers hate Spike Lee. Oh yeah, I didn't know that. Hate Spike Lee. <laughs> Malcolm X is probably one of the only things my mother loves that Spike Lee did. She always felt that Spike Lee portrayed us to be too ignorant and too niggerish. She's always said that because, and, and, and she's talking about it from a New York standpoint. My mother grew up in the South Bronx and the North Bronx, had family in Brooklyn and Harlem. And to her credit, you know, Spike Lee is a little younger than her. And I don't think she really was aware of what could have been going on. But they weren't that far apart for it to be so different. So I kind of get what she's saying. But she always felt like Spike Lee portrayed us to be too niggerish. She literally said that verbatim. Um, and She's Gotta Have It was one of those films that I know a lot of people that were in their 20s and the 80s, like yourself, um, loved that film. They loved what? that era. Like you in the 80s, you were in your near 20, almost, no, 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 I'm bugging, 17, 15, 16? 15, yeah. 15, 16. So I'm going to say anybody from 15. No, yeah, okay, so I'm covering a different range. I'm sorry. Anybody that was like in their 15 to like 25 range in the 80s kind of love Spike. Oh, from yeah? What I you see, feel, you think so? Yeah, from what I see. A lot of people older than that may not feel the same way. I watched She's Gotta Have It. It was not really one of my favorite joints. I didn't like it. By Spike Lee. It was not one of my You talking about the Netflix joint or the old one? Either. The old one was not one of my favorites. The Netflix one. But I what wanted, I respect about it yeah. is that he made that independently mm -hmm. in, in a time when... That was hard to do. Back he then or now? He, no, back then. Back then, definitely. He, he got some credit cards. He maxed out some credit cards yes. in order to make it the original. Yes. That's what put him on. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think it was a great film. However, it was a great effort. It was something that was unheard of at yes. the time. And it opened up the door for many other filmmakers. Films. And, and a lot of people he, didn't like a lot of people didn't like school days. A lot of people didn't like do the yeah. right thing. And then I think that was the order that came yeah. out. I think school yeah. days was next. Yeah. Um but the thing about school days is that it's a it's a hood classic. It's a classic. Uh, as do the right thing is. And yes. I think that he got better with yes. each one of those films. Yes. He got but, better over time. Yeah, he put he put on so many greats. So many it, actors. You know, so many so many future greats. You yes. know what I mean? And gave them opportunities, so I even I if they're never... just B-list actors, even if they're just C-list actors. Denzel, Denzel, you know he gave I mean? a shot twice. Yeah, um, and he nailed your, it. Your Michael Rappaport's, your yeah. your um, can't think of the guy, the Jewish guy. I mean, you Robin know, Harris was in um, a lot of there. these. A lot of these. What's people. the guy's name that he recently passed away too? That was uh uh um Radio Raheem. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of his, his name. name. When he did Dutta Man too in uh, New Man Jack City, New Jack yeah, City. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. in um he was in school days on the football team. Yeah, he was radio. D Ryan. motherfucker, D. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there, one thing I, you can't say about these Spike Lee joints he is he recycles his actors. He definitely very recycles well. his actors, and he has some classic little yep. lines. Yeah, recycles his actors very well. Uh, I mean, he's had some joints, man. I mean, you got the Falcon, um, Clarence from um. Um, Eight Mile, who who was in She Hate Me. She Hate Me is every man's favorite film. She Hate Me, if you haven't seen it, was dope. And it was a crazy concept, but it was dope. But, you know, Spike Lee, you love him or you hate him, you got to respect him. Yeah. I've loved a lot of his work. Um, I get mad at him sometimes. So. Me too. And she's got to have it. I didn't really like the uh, Martin and Gina 2. Uh, Sam Jackson. Uh, yeah. Bill Bill Nunn is Bill the, Nunn. Uh, Bill yeah. Nunn. I don't remember where where did Martin Martin and Gina have Spike Lee joints. I don't remember Martin and Gina being in Spike Lee joints, Kyle. Um. Sam Jackson. I don't remember either. No, I don't. I don't. I don't remember either. So. Uh, I don't remember either. But Spike. But other thing for Spike Lee. Spike Lee directed uh Hip Hop Hooray. Mm -hmm. He directed what was the public enemy video he did? Uh, Rebel without a not no without fight a the power fight, the, fight power. the power yeah which was I mean, tight that was a tight video oh my I mean Spike Spike is a dude Spike is a dude I I like you did not like she's got to have it the original I yeah. thought it was all over the place 
I thought she was just being a thought. <laughs> she was. I thought she was being a thought. And it's funny because the new one that came out on Netflix, there's a lot of discussion back and forth. As it should be. And I wish Jennifer was here because she was like, oh, I love it. Da, da, da. The first thing I saw about this joint, the sex. Now, one thing I can say about Spike, the sex scenes is always on point. He's always giving you the nudity. He's always raw. It's what it's supposed to be. Um, one one of my Facebook friends, a good friend of mine, Shana, said, you know, I don't like the fact that they used all of these. Sam was the DJ. Okay. Kids at Johnny Pump. Sam was the DJ. Got it. Sam Jackson was the DJ. He liked they. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Sam Jackson was the DJ. Good, good call, Kyle. Good call. Um, she said specifically, she said, I don't like the fact that they're using all of these theories of feminism to try to portray this, this picture of female strength to guard the fact that Nola is a straight hoe. And I, those she words said a lot. Dude. Those <laughs> words didn't come from me, a man. Those came from the words of a black New York City raised woman. And I kind of dug what she was saying. You know, it's at some point, and we've talked about this on my show before, like at some point it's like women want an apology from men for a whole gener slew of generational things. And you cannot, when is it, when have we ever taught anybody in a culture that two wrongs make a right? Two wrongs don't make a right, but shit, they might make you feel good, but they still don't make you right. Yeah. So because men have been whores, it means that to get back, women should do the same thing. And it's kind of like the message that's perpetuated is that she's confused. She has three men. She loves them three different ways, and she has the ability to do what she wants. But let the male character insert himself in that role. He's a player. He's a dog. He's a mutt. You know, it, it's it's like, come on, which one is it going to be? And if we're promoting healthy relationships, we're promoting healthy community, healthy families. I mean, this chick has a lot going on. She's messing with a guy who is calling himself separated, but they live in the same home. But he's married. Um, but he really loves her. You know, and, and that happens. It's it's happened historically over time. I, I always joke with people. I always say, shit, Oprah was fucking uh, on Forrest Whitaker and the butler, you know, <laughs> with, 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 uh, with dude from, from next door. So then, then you have that aspect. Then you have the brother, right? You have the light-skinned brother that is, is French, half white, half black, and he's a photographer, he's eclectic, and He's doing this. He's doing that. He's got the nail polish, and he really loves her. Then she has the third guy, Mars Blackman, who they made Puerto Rican, which I thought his character was pretty dope. I like the energy, and Mars really loves her. He's going to bat for her, but she treats him like shit. It's like in today's day and age, you know, I, I, I respect the fact that Spike is giving us this portrayal of she's got to have it. But, I mean, what is the real message here? I also felt like he was trying to force a lot of different themes instead of naturally letting them play out. The acting here and there was spotty. But all in all, I think anything black cinema-wise is good for the culture. Um, I'm not too opposed to it, but I didn't like it. I felt like they were trying to force a lot of different themes. They were trying to paint Nola to be some type of hero, Really, she's fucked up, you know? She's got some issues. You know, there are women out here who are busting their ass, committing to some dude, committing to that dude. She's got three and not making a choice. And some people will argue that, you know, this is only karma coming to these people. But I guess all in all, this, this series made me ask, when is enough going to be enough? When are black people going to stop trying to hurt each other? Emotionally, spiritually, physically, when are they going to stop trying to hurt each other? When are we going to say, you know, my sister, I know you've been through some relationship trauma, some some experiences that are messed up. I'm going to do you better. When are we going to say that? 
You know, it, it's it's no you can't. And I'm I'm big on being consistent. I don't care about you being an asshole unless you're consistent. And if you're consistent, I'm cool with that. But you can't give me the one argument on one hand that justify it for brothers, but then when the sister does it, it's 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 all good. And I said it to say that black men, we are really under attack more than ever right now. Definitely. We are we are more than we're under attack more than I'm not gonna say more than we were four or five hundred years ago, but in in modern society, the black man is under attack. And I'm not even gonna say because you have so many different ways to think about it, right? Do you know what cisgender means? Cisgender is C I S gender is when a man a male is born a male and identifies himself to be still a male because that's his birthright. You have males that were born males that don't identify themselves with being males. Um, like somebody said on the show, they feel like people have too many choices regardless. The black male that identifies himself as being a black male, I'm not talking about heterosexual or, or, or homosexual. Any male that sees themselves as a black male is under attack. You know, people out here killing us, over criminalizing us, turning their backs on us, jailing us. I said that uh, we can't do shit about it. You know, I've seen show after show after show after show after show after show talk about the black male and how much of a villain he is. Where is the place of a black male in the world today in 2017? What place do we really have? Well, we, you know, the, the thing is, is that I don't know if that's a bad thing. I think that what it should do is it should force us to stand up. Mm-hmm. It should force us to be strong and project the image that we want, the true image. Now, if we sit back and lay back, then we can let people define us or we can take this opportunity to define ourselves. But the problem with that is, is that there are there are a small sector of us that can take that and flourish. Yeah. There was a Not large time, yeah. lot of us that will take that and perish. Unfortunately, that's Unfortunately, true. Unfortunately. And we're not and I and I think to your point, what we may have to do is hold each other more accountable. And I, I've said this before. You had the black girls rock movement. You had the, yeah, you had the Black Girls Rock movement. You had all these movements. We need our black males to celebrate each other. That's first and foremost. We need our black males to get together and celebrate other black males and have a coalition, have a slogan. Why don't we have a black boys rock? Why don't we have a black men rock? Why are we not bigging each other up? Why is it still taboo in 2017 for you to support your black brother and the efforts that he does without having some side angle? And what I'm going to do, and I'm going to bring in a slew of brothers for this show to talk about their experiences, their life experiences, their trials and tribulations. And we're going to talk about this going to be the black male empowerment episode. Because we need something to where we can talk shit to one another. Facts. We can disagree. We can agree. We can share perspective. We can enlighten one another. You know, we we can damn near about to fight. (laughs) We need something to literally empower the black males. You know, the the black women, the black girls rock movement is on and popping. Black girl magic. You can see that anywhere. You can see that anywhere, but it's not enough. And I'm not negating that it needs to be done, but we need to lift one another. And I'm not saying that the black sisters are not trying to lift us. What I'm saying is as black men, we need to do better in uplifting ourselves. We depend so much on so many other people, whether it's white culture, pop culture, whatever it is to uplift us, we need to do a better job of, of, of uplifting ourselves. We need to highlight ourselves. We need to have more black male forums. You know, the, the essence of the barbershop 
is 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 diminishing. You know, so many people are so sensitive to talk about subjects and address different things and support each other. You can go to a barbershop, man, nowadays, and it's so quiet. You know, barbershops are meant to be the black man's pulpit. It's meant to be the black man's confessional booth. And it's very few far in between do we have that. You know, I know over at security, you got Picasso Cuts. You know, that that's the spot where brothers get busy at. Uh, Kala is saying, because we've never been taught that we matter. We are real weak right now. And that's true. We have never been taught that we matter. And I've referenced this before. We can go back to Chris Rock saying, you know, nothing else had to be done. My father didn't need this. He didn't need that. All he knew, he was going to get the big piece of chicken. And as black males, we, we self-neglect ourselves. You know, our suicide rate, completion rate at one point in this country was the highest among any other ethnicity or population. Because if we really felt like we needed to get it done, we was going to do it. You know, we die from heart and, and heart failure, disease and, and, and stress faster than anyone else. You know, we bear a lot on our shoulders and it's not really appreciated and reciprocated uh, in general. I'm not going to say that there are not people that, that, that recognize the struggle and the plight of the black man. But what we have to do, what other ethnicities and genders have done, we need to get on our, our soapbox and start to praise each other and let each other know how important we really are. So I'm planning to do the, the, the black male empowerment episode. Kyla, I see you on here. You're welcome to come because you're a reckless dude. I want you on the show because you're going to see some crazy shit anyway. Um, so I think I'm going to aim for that for next Thursday, December 7th, which is actually my birthday. Actually, a birth, actually my birthday. And, uh, I, I'm going to bring it in here. Um, I think I'm going to try to request off on Friday. Because if anybody knows me, I'm, I'm going to probably drink during and after the show. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I need to get up to stay asleep on that Friday. But we definitely need to do the Black Male Empowerment Show. But uh, once again, today's broadcast is brought to you in part by the Baltimore Music Awards. Let your voice be heard at the 2017 BMAs. Polls are open for the 7th Annual Red Carpet Event. Honoring Baltimore, log in, log on, I'm sorry, to BaltimoreMusicAwards.com before December 3rd to cast your vote in all categories. This is RadioOnFire.com, home of the Diamond K morning show, new episodes streaming every day at 9 a.m. Radio on Fire reaches about 276,000 viewers per month. Advertise your product with us here, service or event on Radio on Fire by sponsoring any one of the shows, any episode of the shows, as low as $50. Visit RadioOnFire.com slash Pro when get started. If you want to see any past episodes of any of your Radio on Fire shows, specifically to speak easy, visit RadioOnFire.com. Watch us on demand. Click radio shows and the name of your show on any episode that you've missed. Kyle, you can go to hell. You can go to hell because you said fuck my birthday, black ass, but I'm with it. I mean, bring your black ass up to Baltimore next week. We're going to do the Black Male Empowerment Show. We need to discuss major black male communal issues. We need to discuss what we're going to do as black men to facilitate and foster a better community for our people as black men. So there you have it. Don McKay, man, I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. I appreciate Absolutely. you Did having your thing me. As always. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give me too many, too much credit there, man. Yeah, Jennifer couldn't come out tonight. She's whack. Whatever she's doing, I hope you're not having. <laughs> I hope you're not having a great time. I hope you're having a good time. I'm gonna harass you and find out what's going on. But uh, this was the Speakeasy. One half of the Speakeasy. I'm EJ Stewart, a sophisticated savage. Uh, before I go, shout out to TJ and Danielle Byerson. Um. Two of them were guests on my show. They have a podcast, Lovers Quarrel. I was on their show on Tuesday. Um, they've been together since high school, and I think you can catch this show on Stitch It or something like that, but it's called Lovers Quarrel. Follow them on Instagram. And uh, as always, man, we out. Peace.